This episode of The Capsule in Conversation is brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Harrogate is the home of the British Spa and Britain's premium natural source water. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Capsule in Conversation. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm joined by hypnotherapist, anxiety expert and host of the Karma You podcast, Chloe Brotherbridge, to talk being resilient, beating back stress and building a more confident you. So settle down, turn us up and get ready to join in with our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure to have you with us as we wave goodbye to February and march into spring. It's been a very tough few months for the majority of us being plunged back into full lockdown at the start of the year, but my special guest today is on hand to talk us through managing the stress and anxiety of lockdown burnout. She's a hypnotherapist and anxiety coach, the author of self-development books, The Anxiety Solution and Brave New Girl, with her third book, The Confidence Solution, released just this year. She's also the host of the chart-topping Karma You podcast. It's the brilliant Chloe Brotherbridge. Hi, Chloe. Hi there. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. On the thank you for being with me today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with me. How are you doing? You're coming to me today from Bali. How is it out there? It's uh, it's it's the rainy season at the moment, so it's been raining more than I've ever seen rain before. And I'm from Lancashire, where it rains a lot. Um, yeah, but it's beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm very very lucky to be here at the moment. I mean, that you only moved relatively recently, and that's you know quite a big move to make. What prompted you to kind of go across to the other side of the world? Well, I'd always wanted to try living abroad, and thought it was a a time. Uh, you know, it was a it was a time that was we thought we wouldn't be able to do it, but um, we were in the end. And there's actually a lot less COVID here for some reason. I think because everything's outdoors, it's, it seems a lot safer. And I'm very lucky that my work is all online so I thought I'd take the opportunity before I uh, start a family and that sort of thing so taking that opportunity while I can really. It's, I mean it's an amazing opportunity as you say to kind of just go okay you know what we're gonna do it. Do you think that were you already planning that or do you think like the situation with coronavirus kind of prompted you to get on with it? Yeah we were planning it and we thought with everything that was going on that we weren't going to do it but I think um, when, when the situation changed in England, we were allowed to travel again. I, I, I seized the opportunity. And yeah, I have to be honest, not having a garden in London in, in the summer in the UK in 2020 was a bit challenging. Mm. And so it's nice to just be able to be outdoors a little bit more. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, you're a qualified hypnotherapist and anxiety expert. Now, what was it that led you into that field in the beginning? It's quite a random career choice, really, um, <laughs> being a hypnotherapist. But I, uh, I, I met a few hypnotherapists um, over the years. When I was 11, I went to see an osteopath and he was also a hypnotherapist. And he would tell me, you know, the stories of what you could do with hypnotherapy. And it just really intrigued me. And then I was traveling when I was 22 and I met a doctor a GP who was also a hypnotherapist and she said she was helping people with weight loss and hypnotherapy and I'd had a lot of issues with anxiety myself and um, I was having panic attacks and really struggled with social situations and would get very kind of nervous and worried about things and I discovered hypnotherapy recordings I, I sort of listened to things on YouTube in, in the beginning and I was I was very skeptical at first but I found that they really did something they, they did start to change things as I listened every day for a couple of weeks and I just thought this is really interesting and so I yeah I ended up training um to do that because it helped me and because I'd had my own anxiety and wanted to help other people who, who've been struggling as well but so prior to that then what what were your kind of interests in school um or college or anything I was in I was into science so I was very strong on the science subjects I, I did a degree in nutrition first of all which had quite a scientific um, basis to it so I worked in the NHS as a nutritionist for a few years but I think that there was something about that working I was working a lot in weight management and I realized that the psychological side of 
um, weight management was so significant and I became really interested in that side of it and looked into how hypnotherapy could help with that. Um, and so my, my, my focus really shift more to the psychological um, side of things after, after working in, in kind of health for a few years. It's so funny that you say that because I remember back in the 90s, my best friend's mum had a Paul McKenna weight loss video, the hypnotherapy one. And me and yes. her, and I think we must have only been about 14, decided to have a look at this video and we weren't really sure what we were doing. And then we were like, oh, do you think we'll be tricked forever? And, you know, we had this kind of mad concept of what it was. I still don't know. I mean, I have to say I'm quite... Um, I manage my diet relatively well and I've been like the same weight for the last 12 years and my best friend always says it's because we watched that video <laughs> you know <laughs> and I'm still a bit skeptical as to whether it was but but still there is definitely something in it isn't there and I, I think obviously now from that time it seemed quite mystical now where we're at now it's much more embraced in terms of different therapies you know people are talking more openly about their anxiety um, and do you think therefore it's a it's a it's quite a nice space for you to work in the amount of people now that embrace kind of more holistic sides of um, therapy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've, I've been a hypnotherapist for 10 years now and certainly in the beginning, there was a lot of having to persuade people that I wasn't going to you know, put them under and make them do something silly, like act like a chicken or, you know, a lot of people were quite skeptical. I had people not want to look me in the eye in case I hypnotized them or something. <laughs> um, I think people are a lot more open-minded to things and, and realizing that um, there are so many different ways to help yourself and we all respond to things differently. And I think we're more willing to give things a try. And I think the fact that everything's online now as well, you know, we can listen to you know, therapy recordings or you can see a therapist on Zoom you know, I think we're getting that opportunity to, to try different things and get exposed to different techniques. So tell me a little bit more then about the work that you do with your clients and what would you say at the minute is the most common concern that you're seeing? Yeah, so I, I work a lot with people with anxiety and self-esteem issues and confidence. I would say the most common theme that I see amongst people is things around the inner critic and our inability, it seems, to be kind to ourselves, to treat ourselves as we would treat any other human being. It seems as though for so many of us, we really give ourselves a hard time. We beat ourselves up. We think that we need to be perfect. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And that can be particularly problematic when things aren't going to plan in our lives. And at a time right now during the pandemic where people might have lost their job or they're spending a lot of time on their own or their relationships might be strained because you're all in a house together. When things aren't going well, sometimes that can be when the inner critic gets really loud and we, and, we, and we need to be kind to ourselves more than ever at those times, but that's the time that it can get really loud. So I think if there's one theme that I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is, is stuff around the inner critic. That is so true. I mean, even in our household, you know, the amount of uh, the, the tension that is built by being in the house together all the time. And I've taken it so personally at times. I've taken it very much like, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so if everything's not going to my plan, I feel so out of kilter, and then I feel like I'm failing, and then I start getting cross with myself, then I get cross at everybody else, and it just feels like this snowball effect of, as you said, this, I start really being really hard on myself, and then hard on everyone else around me. And where do you think those traits come from? You know, is it is it in our DNA? Is it something that we've learn what where where do you think this comes from yeah i think there, there's, there are lots of reasons for that um it can be things from childhood quite often so the, the sorts of things we're told the messages we're given it's thought that perhaps women have this slightly more than men this kind of inner critic and perfectionism because perhaps we're raised to be good girls whereas boys are told you know go and climb that tree you know you fall up fall over in the mud it's fine you know boys boys play rough and Kind of tease each other whereas girls we're we're kind of encouraged subtly from a young age to be good girls and to stay safe and to, to look nice and to not and to please other people and so we're, we're sent all these messages from an early age so i mean that can be one reason we might feel like we need to put other people first and not really take care of ourselves or do things perfectly a lot of the time um but yeah it can be individual things so if you have say critical parents you know the way that our parents speak to us can be how we speak to ourselves and we can really take that on as our programming 
yeah, but I mean, it's a complicated issue. Everyone is different, but those are some of the things that can, can play a role. I mean, that's so interesting, especially when you talk about, you know, girls being encouraged to be a certain way. It's like, it makes me laugh when you think about things like Bridgerton and, you know, that whole social kind of get married, all that, 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 that really, ex- and that still exists in parts of the world, but it was so prevalent here, obviously, during those Regency times. And you think that kind of social um, conditioning has fed down so much to kind of where we're at now, where, as you say, you know, even from our great grandmothers, our great grandmothers, are w- watching The Crown. It's the same kind of thing when you see through generations how this is how you must behave, and if you're going to be a good girl. And isn't that interesting? That I think you're right. That there's so many um, issues that come with that as a human being, because really we are human beings, just like boys are human beings. And so the way that we we're interpreting it is that we're uncomfortable with it um it's a really interesting point that now anxiety and depression can often get lumped together can't they but they're actually quite different um you know you just tell me through from from a professional's point of view what actually is the difference with anxiety because lots of people are suffering from it at the minute or they think they're suffering from it but they're not sure yeah i mean they do often come hand in hand anxiety and depression you know, often get diagnosed together. I think there's a difference between anxiety, the mental health condition, and anxiety, the normal human emotion that we all are gonna feel from time to time because every everyone is gonna worry, everyone at some point or another is gonna feel fear, feel afraid. Those sorts of things are actually normal. Um, and if someone's thinking to themselves, you know, is it is it anxiety with a capital A or a small A, as in the mental health issue or the kind of normal, they should speak to their doctor and they can diagnose it and they would ask different questions about how, how long has that been going on? How much is it affecting your life? Does it affect your sleep? Those sorts of things can be considered when you think about whether it is, you know, anxiety, the mental health issue. Um, but anxiety can be so many things. It can be worrying it can be very physical the physical sensations of having your heart racing not being able to keep still feeling as though your your chest is tight and that differs from depression which is more about our mood and um you know whether we're feeling low in our mood whether we're feeling low in our energy um so it's it's slightly different in terms of that diagnosis i mean i I definitely do suffer with anxiety, more prevalent at certain times. And it's what prompted me to put my business in the direction that it's gone because I was suffering so badly with it. As you said, chest pains, shaky hands, you know, palpitations, not being able to sleep, the worry. But I'd not experienced depression at that point. And, you know, like you said, they are quite different in the sense that anxiety, you kind of... um, you have to almost ride the moment, don't you? If you're having some kind of like a panic attack or an anxiety attack, you've got to go kind of breathe through it and you will come out the other side. Um, depression is obviously different with its the way it kind of takes hold and, um, you know, um, the way it kind of plays out, I suppose, over a period of time. But now you've spoken very openly before about saying that you've had severe panic attacks, you know, during your teens. I mean... Tell me about that and tell me about kind of what you think instigated that. Yeah, so I I started having panic attacks when I was 15. And looking back, I I can see what what it was caused by. But at the time, I didn't really know. I I would say I was very unself-aware. I hadn't really ever thought about how my childhood could have affected how I was feeling. I wasn't in touch with my emotions. I didn't understand my thoughts. And so at the time it just felt very confusing. And I, it seemed as though I was just having these panic attacks out of the blue and uh, those continued, you know, I had panic attacks as I got a bit older, once during a presentation when I got up to speak in front of loads of people, which was just awful. Um, And yeah, different times, but yeah. So I like, like a lot of people who have had panic attacks, and this is very common that I hear from people, really thought I was dying when I had that first panic attack. I felt this intense wave of panic crash over me. My chest got really tight. I felt like I couldn't breathe. My heart was racing. I felt very kind of out of touch with reality, almost like I wasn't quite real. I felt like, yeah, it's very, very confusing and scary. And I was 
saying to my friend, I'm, ha I'm having a heart attack. I need to go to hospital. You know, something really, really wrong. And my friend just looked at me like, you're fine. Like, what are you, what are you worried about? But internally, you know, I was going through this incredibly intense experience. And um, I remember I, I called up the, uh, I think it was 111 where you, you, you don't go to hospital, you call 111 yeah. and we spoke to someone on the phone and they kind of calmed me down and talked me down from it. But after that experience, I felt very, like I couldn't trust my body. I felt like this panic could strike at any time. And it's almost like the fear of the fear becomes this um, self-fulfilling prophecy where you're scared of having another panic attack and then it happens because you're, you're on edge all the time. And um, I think learning more about it you know as I got older I realized that I had to learn about myself and learn about my emotions and learn how to calm myself down and not bottle things up because I think I just kept everything inside and I had a lot of shame about who I was and never felt good enough and put a lot of pressure on myself and going through that process of having therapy and trying different approaches meditation to get to know myself and to, to open up and share and talk about things, you know, really helped to um, release that tension that I think I was just holding inside for a long time. Yeah, because this is the thing is that I, I've met a few people who've had a similar situation to yours. And actually, it's that experience. It's a few, a few therapists, actually, that have brought them to where they, they are now, because at that time, it was so horrendous for them. And they, they were like, how am I going to get through this? And then obviously with the knowledge that you learn to kind of try and calm yourself down, to try and protect yourself, you then naturally want to pass on to others that are going through something similar. Um, you know, anxiety at the minute is it's extremely prevalent in young women with 28% with of 18 to 24 year olds reporting that they feel anxious most of the time. Now, what do you think in this modern day world are the most contributing factors to that? I think there's, there's a lot of different things. I mean, if we think about how we evolved as human beings to live in small communities to be out in nature to be having lots of physical activity to have you know lots of people around us all the time we're so far away from how we how our bodies evolved and and so I think that that disconnection from nature and from you know our you know our true nature has has a role to play I suppose as well the the fast pace of life the fact that we know what everyone is up to at 24 hours a day we can compare ourselves we can get have this fear of missing out we um, there's a lot of pressures on us in terms of how we look achievements um, a lot of us feel like we're not good enough because we're we feel like we have to measure up to some kind of ideal some ideal of perfection there's a lot of pressures. Social media gets a bad reputation and social media is amazing in so many ways, but it undoubtedly contributes to our anxiety because we don't really switch off. It, our phones are always there. We check them first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Emails are getting replied to at all times of day. We're not really getting that downtime. Life is very, very full on. Um, so there's yeah so many reasons, but those are a few that I can think of that, that that I think are contributing to that. I mean, that's definitely one question I had for you a bit later on was about you know the impact of social media and the the growth of it kind of like just the boom in the last ten years. And as you said, it can't be you know you look at the the statistics with anxiety and especially amongst young people and even you know shockingly the suicide rates with young people and then you see the graph of social media and you know you have to think the two are definitely interlinked now you personally have like a 45,000 you know mass following on Instagram alone how do you feel about being seen as an influencer because as you said you know social media and that term can get a really bad rap but you use your platforms to to really try and help people what what's your connotations of that term yeah it's interesting it's, it's funny isn't it how you uh label yourself I, I do sometimes struggle with how to describe what i do because there is a lot of a lot of my work is on social media then i do writing and I, then i'm a therapist that's probably my real my real job so I, I do think of myself more as a therapist and a coach than an influencer but I think it's tricky because you know we can influence people in really positive ways we can use our platforms for good and I, I definitely try to do that 
Um, it's tricky when you're when you're showing up as yourself, I think, because not everyone's going to agree with everything that you say, with your perspective, and you have to put yourself out there and hope that the people that that kind of need the message that you have are going to are going to find it and resonate with it. But I have found that it's difficult to keep everyone happy when you the more people that follow you, that the harder it is to please everyone because. Um, everyone has their own interpretation of what you're sharing and what you're doing. And so this is it. it is an interesting one. Yeah, it's like, that's it. That for me, the term, I've had that labeled to, to me and I'm like, um, I'm an actor. Like that's kind of where I started. And at first I was incredibly defensive about it. Just like somebody once called me a blogger about five years ago and I was very defensive about that. I was like, I've trained my whole life to do this, which then makes, you know, the connotations of that that's not a viable career or something. Whereas actually I've met a lot of bloggers who work incredibly hard, have built these amazing businesses. And I think, as you said, with social media, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you have to kind of engage your following and you want to reach those people with with your message, which is of kindness, of being kind to yourself. But you don't want to get lumped into this other kind of world that's actually perpetuating the problem of what you're trying to help. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting discussion and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years if they if they get stricter with what people can advertise because I think you know some of the things that get advertised on there <laughs> my influencers it's not it's not the best for us or for our health or for the planet so I wonder how that will evolve over the next few years I mean that's interesting as you say I personally agree with you I think you know people it, it, the advertising standards should be more, much much more strict because then then it would help people be able to differentiate between what's genuine and watch for somebody just to make a quick book basically and that's where it becomes dangerous you know of, of siphoning out kind of who's who's got the real skill set that you need to go to and who's just trying to flog something and um, let's just talk about imposter syndrome because I know this is something you've suffered from I suffer from it all the time and again you know where where do you think that comes from it, it, it's you always feel like, well, I always feel like I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be there. Oh, they don't like me. Oh, I'm not very good at this. You know, do you think, again, that's a childhood thing? Yeah, well, I, I suppose, firstly, imposter syndrome is incredibly common, depending on which survey you look at, anywhere from 60 to 90 or 100% of women will experience imposter syndrome. So it's not abnormal. It's actually a universal thing that so many of us experience and it's it's more commonly found actually in successful women so women who are at the top of their game you know, people like michelle obama have spoken about how they have imposter syndrome so <laughs> oh my God. she she has it i think it's okay for us yeah I, I wonder if you know as humans you know there's something really vulnerable about putting yourself out there and being a leader and you know speaking in front of groups or doing something new and I think that vulnerability is completely natural you know our survival when we were evolving was related to whether or not we were included in the tribe and whether people accepted us and whether people you know liked us if they didn't we might have got kicked out of the tribe and then we might have died so what other people think of us and and how we feel about ourselves is all kind of tied up and so and so in some ways, I think it's natural, you know, when we're doing something new and we're stepping out or speaking up, when we're, you know, leading other people to have imposter syndrome. And I think it's about how we manage it and our relationship with that, knowing that it's not a sign that we're not good enough. It's not a sign that we're flawed or we're a fake. Actually, a bit of self-doubt or a bit of fear is just really normal and natural. And can we, can we embrace it and work with it instead of, instead of shying away from things? I love the idea that, as you said, then it's quite a primal, it's quite a, a primal instinct of when you think about, as you said, where we've evolved from, it makes complete sense. It does, doesn't it? Like when you think about it, and I love that. I think that's when you can consider it in that concept, I think it's easier then to swallow and you kind of feel less, a little less mad, I suppose. Now, alongside your work as a therapist, you're also a best-selling author with your highly acclaimed books, The Anxiety Solution and Brave New Girl, receiving praise across the world. So tell me about the impetus for, for writing these books. When I first started as a hypnotherapist, I was working in all sorts of issues, smoking and weight loss and a bit of anxiety. And I, having had my own anxiety issues, a lot of therapists will say this, you start to attract people 
almost automatically and naturally that have struggled with the same things as you. So it's a strange thing that happens. A lot of therapists will say this. And I was working more and more with people with anxiety and I was hearing the same sorts of things again about people not feeling good enough and beating themselves up and feeling the pressures of modern life. And I really wanted to write a book that addressed all these things and was specifically written for women and addressed all the kind of, yeah, the things that I heard people struggling with in my therapy room and the things that I'd also struggled with as well. So that's why I wrote The Anxiety Solution. And then Brave New Girl, which The Confidence Solution is a, is a new title for Brave New Girl, in fact. Oh, so it's right, actually just okay. two, two books up until now. Um, that was kind of like the next step. So once you've worked a bit on your anxiety, the next step is to step into your confidence and start speaking up more and um, achieving your dreams and being able to set boundaries and say no. So I really saw that as the next step for us, you know, once we're in a bit of a calmer state to, to really um, move forward with our development and our growth. I mean, it's incredibly clear that you are so dedicated to empowering people. I mean, what, what is it that motivates you? I think just knowing what it's like to struggle and knowing how horrible it feels when you're so anxious that you feel like you're hold, having to hold yourself back from situations or being so nervous and scared and then seeing that actually there's another side to it that actually, you know, I realized I didn't have to feel that way forever. There were things that I could do and I could change and I could move forward in areas of my life. I could start to feel more confident and learn to speak in public, having gone from having horrific panic attacks to being able to now speak in front of hundreds of people. And yeah, it feels very important to me to, to share that and to help other people to see that there's another way that they can be. Oh, I love that. I mean, tell me about the people that have inspired you as well on your journey. I'm so interested to hear about your grandmother who went backpacking around India in her seventies. So just tell me a little bit more about her and your journey with other people. Yeah, so my granny is very inspiring to me. She has always been a very independent person. She's a, she's a meditation teacher. She was a hippie in the 60s. And she, and I met with her in India in, yeah, probably about 12 years ago now. She was in her late 70s. And we went like motorbiking through India and wild swimming and all these sorts of things. She's very intrepid. So I've always been inspired by her you know, desire just to, to do what she wants to do and not care what people think or go for the kind of the rules of what a granny should be doing with their lives. Didn't um, so she I also find her build and inspiring. design a house when she was 80? Yeah, yeah. So she, she bought a plot of land, designed it, project managed this house bill that took years to, to come to come about. She's very happy in her house now in, uh, in Scotland. So yeah, she's a, she's a very interesting character and, and inspiring. And I, I often think about, when I think about other people that inspire me, I, not necessarily about specific people, but I sometimes think about our ancestors that we have as human beings and all the things that our ancestors would have gone through, surviving an ice age, you know, traveling across continents, you know, going through famine and war and all the things that our ancestors have gone through and all that strength and wisdom and courage that has meant that we get to be here today. You know, they all survived to, to, to create us basically. And, and I like to think about that strength being in all of us. And, you know, I draw a lot of resilience and, and courage from, from imagining my ancestors, basically. I love that concept because I've thought about this before about explorers. And so like, I, I have, I've been fortunate enough to travel a lot. And one of my favorite places is, is the Maldives. And I remember when, when we first went with my husband, I kind of was like, oh my God, you know, imagine people just bumping into this on a ship and then all those terrible sea journeys, you know, when you see films about the sea and how horrendous it could be and people would say goodbye to their families and go off and you just didn't know when you'd see them again and, you know, Christopher Columbus and people like that and I just thought, God, how brave. They didn't, they didn't know where they were going to end and they were going to just go, go and take on the ocean and somehow they kind of made it through and then I'll I'll be honest I do the same thing I kind of go well if they did that and they had no idea where they were going everything was so uncertain and they managed to keep going and build a new life and build new communities and you know and work with other people that were there and stuff and I think crikey that there is bravery in us all there must be yeah that's the that was a yeah great example of going into the unknown and 
and uh, yeah, having that courage. And yeah, I think we, we all have that capacity within us. So what do you think are the most important lessons you've learned kind of both in your career and in your personal life as well? I remember it's something that my granny said actually again. I remember her sitting me down once. I think she saw me I have overworking, to what your granny's called. pushing myself. What's your granny called? <laughs> She's called Christian Wharton. Oh, I love that. Right. So tell me about tell me what she told you. <laughs> so she said to me, um, she said, find happiness now. The time for happiness is now. Don't put it off because you end up putting it off forever. And I, I remember I was in a point where work was the most important thing. And I was telling myself, right, I'm going to get through this busy period with work and then I'll allow myself to have a break and enjoy life. And actually she was right. You know, when we're in that mindset of putting off happiness and putting off joy and pleasure and rest, we can just be on that treadmill forever and never really have the time to save a life. So I really try and take heed of that and uh, enjoy life and make time for rest and prioritize um, fun and joy instead of just work all the time so that's a big thing that's, that's helped me and tell me also now about the karma you podcast which is just such a fabulous resource for anybody that's struggling with anxiety again i mean i'm sure it's similar to kind of what you said before but what was your intention of kind of starting that was it to kind of reach more people or was it because i've heard from another therapist before that she said people found it difficult reading and so she wanted to do kind of an audio version i mean is that similar to you yeah that was that was a part of it i knew that people really liked my audio books and so i wanted to to, to do that. And I mean, to be honest, a big part of it was, was quite selfish in that I wanted to speak to interesting people. I wanted to learn from people. And I also wanted to grow my own confidence at speaking to people because that had been something that I'd really struggled with. And it, a few years ago, even, I would never have imagined myself being able to do a podcast and interview people and speak in public and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, part of it was wanting just to grow my confidence and, and do it for that. And yeah, it's been three years that I've been doing it now and it feels like a massive privilege to get to be in people's ears every week and, uh, you know, entertain them while they're on their walks, on their dog walks or at the gym or driving. Um, and I love it. It's been great to get to speak to people. And, and a lot of people say it feels a bit like a therapy session. I think um, when you're listening to people having a chat and it's on a, a topic that, you're, that you really resonate with and it can feel like just getting a bit of therapy in your ears free therapy for everyone uh, well that's kind of, I've, I've, yeah. I agree with that and some people have asked me before like what what do you like about doing your podcast I'm like it's like therapy it's like equally like therapy for the person kind of meeting the other person because you're like oh, really learn and you learn yeah. so much within <laughs> this realm and what's lovely about it as well I think is the intimacy that you're allowed to have that one-on-one -on -one time with somebody and it's not snatched you know it's a really nice element where you can actually have a proper conversation and take the time to learn to then go away and kind of process it all but I think maybe you know for you and, and I think it was a similar situation for me was that when I became very nervous I needed to have control of the things around me so when you're put into a podcast situation which is kind of like your own little booth that you're in you're in charge of and you don't have all that pressure of maybe a big conference room and you know people kind of shouting at you and huddling you along it allows you to kind of get the same information across without all of that pressure is that the same yeah well it's um i used to always record them in a in a recording studio and now obviously it's all at home so it's amazing to be able to still still do do this and connect with people and create hopefully something that's really helpful for people to listen to oh it's definitely very very helpful i mean what do you think are the key components to leading a karma life i think it's something that we we have to constantly come back to it's not like we meditate once or have a few therapy sessions once and then we're we're cured and we're going to be calm forever. I think it's a real ongoing process and we're kind of up against, as we were talking about before, the, the pressures of modern life and the speed of modern life and all the uncertainties that we have right now about the future. And so continue to come back to taking care of ourselves and being kind to ourselves and getting to know and understand ourselves is so, so important. So I really think it's an ongoing practice and, um, and something that, helps us and then it enables us to be better for our friends and family and colleagues you know when, the more we take care of ourselves and and you know 
nourish our nervous systems by taking time to be calm, the better we can be for other people. So I think everyone, everyone benefits from that. It's still such a funny concept for people though, isn't it? Like self-care and, you know, looking after yourself. Some people just still, uh, the, you know, the, the message, we, we are trying to get that message out there of how important it is, but there are a lot of people still that kind of think it's a selfish attitude and we've got to change that, haven't we? We've got to change that kind of idea of to look after you is a selfish thing. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that's, it's unbelievably common, isn't it? And even though, you know, we've been talking about this as a culture about self-care for several years now, really, um, in the mainstream, and yet it's still filtering through. And I think it's those old beliefs that maybe we brought up, we were brought up with, you know, we might have seen our parents, you know, being very selfless and, you know, never um, taking care of themselves and never stopping to rest. And you know that that might have gone back through the generations, and so it really is trying to deprogram that and, and learn that there's another way to be that we don't have to be martyrs to other people. I also think as well there's a generational thing. So me and my mother-in-law had this conversation, where she's very selfless, and I I kept thinking, oh, does she think I'm really selfish? And she once said to me, I don't live the life that you live she said I lived a life where I had the luxury of being at home and my sole job was to look after my children she said and that's that's what I wanted to do and I loved it and that's what my focus was she was like you are doing trying to do that trying to run a business trying to run here trying to run there she's like your life is so stressful she's like you have to take time for yourself and it, I just thought that was so kind and lovely of her I burst into tears actually I was like thank you for understanding because yeah. she was trying to make me understand when I was comparing myself as a mother to what she did with like my husband and I was like oh your mum your mum always like ties the shoelaces and your mum always cuts the crusts off the sandwiches and she was like yeah but that's I had time to do that she's like that's not it's not a nobody's looking down on you if you don't get all that done she's like I did not have a million and other one things to do and I think that's very common with women of this particular generation isn't it we're trying to meet the old-fashioned standards of you know maybe motherhood or being turned out or whatever with the fast pace of this new modern life yeah and i would say that the pressure for for perfection as we've touched on already and doing things perfectly as a mum and looking perfect and not aging and not gaining weight all those things that probably the older generations didn't have quite so much pressure in those ways Oh, definitely. I mean, the past year has undoubtedly been very stressful and uncertain for the majority of us. And we're coming to kind of what what feels like the end of a, of a, a very difficult year. But a lot of us are now getting to that point where we've had this whole coronavirus like burnout, basically, of having to juggle a million and one different things how can we manage getting through that into this next phase so that when we eventually come out of it we do still have some energy i'm hearing from a lot of people that they're very exhausted right now that their sleep has been troubled that they're having kind of more more active dreams and so yeah i think i think it's about trying to just stay positive for the final what hopefully is the final push of lockdown and hopefully things gonna be opening up soon with the vaccines and everything um doing what you can to, to take care of yourself in this time, I think. And, and knowing that it's okay if you feel exhausted and you need to rest more, or you need to have a nap in the day, or you need to ask for help from somebody. I think giving yourself permission to do that and not expecting that you should, you know, that things are gonna be like they were before because it's a very different situation. I think trying to take some pressure off um, ourselves and accept that it is a challenging time it is a challenging time and that's okay. It's okay if you're struggling as well. You know, I think the majority of people are or have found at, at times, certainly during the last year, that they've struggled a lot. So, you know, you're definitely not alone. So often, you know, I was doing a workshop the other day and people think that they're the only one that is, is struggling in a way or they're the only one that isn't dealing with things. Like we kind of think that everyone else has it all together and we're, we're a mess and everyone else is sorted. But actually everyone is... You know, everyone's got something going on everyone's, everyone's got something going on everyone's kind of a mess a beautiful mess um so so don't think you're the only one I think I, I would want people to know that as well 
So tell me about your future plans now with Karma U because it's a, a brilliant resource. Obviously, your website's amazing and you do offer so many different things on there, workshops, therapies, you know, books. And just tell me what your future plans are with it. Yeah, so a lot of my work is online. Um, I do a lot of group programs, group coaching and hypnotherapy. I've got a membership called the Karma U Collective, which is supporting people. Um, online every month with different tools and resources and a community that come together to support each other and just continuing really with the podcast and writing another book hopefully in the next year or so and um, yeah I think that's about it podcast courses and books what would the next book be about because I'm so intrigued I'm like oh what will it be (laughs) (laughs) I can't actually say I'm having oh, conversations at the moment. Um, when I figure that out, I will announce it. But yeah, it's, di- it's difficult to choose. It's difficult to choose. because There's so many things that I'm interested in and so many things that I would love to write about. So just about narrowing it down, really. Oh, we'll have to definitely kind of uh, wait for that one because I'm like, give me the information. I need it. I need to be better. I need to kind of feel better. And that's what I love about you and what what I love about kind of your whole platform is the wealth of information and relatable information as well that, you know, you can get from you and, and from your platform. Is, it's it's easy to digest into, into a, a form that I think you can understand and start to think ah and add the dots and put the pieces together as to why you feel a certain way and it's such a brilliant resource um thank you so much chloe it has been an absolute joy to talk to you today and to get all of your brilliant advice thank you so much yeah great to speak to you i hope you guys at home have enjoyed being with us today as well Chloe's brilliant books are available online and in audible form at all good bookshops. I urge you to add them to your bedtime reading or listening. You can also find the Karma You podcast across all major podcast providers and also find out more about Chloe's therapy services at www.karmau.com. If you'd like more wellbeing, fashion and beauty, then as always, you can visit us at our website, www.thecapsule.co.uk, where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by visiting the In Conversation page and subscribe to any of our podcast channels and YouTube. Please do leave us your rates and reviews. It's been so lovely to hear all about this new series. Thank you so much for listening. If you're a social butterfly, you can also catch us on Instagram and Facebook at Official Capsule. I will be back next week with another very special guest. So all that's left for us to say today is goodbye. So it's goodbye from Chloe. Thank you. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. This episode of The Capsule in Conversation was brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Bottled at source, Harrogate Spring offers a pure, refreshing taste with a delicate blend of naturally occurring minerals and electrolytes. Perfect for healthy hydration.